Welcome, good morning. Welcome to the hearing on socio-ecological design. I'm Katrin Klingen, one of the curators of the Anthropocene project and one of the organizers of the Anthropocene curriculum. And quickly, the rules you already are familiar with. We have 50 minutes uh, for this hearing. And we will start with a 10 minutes statement by Bründis Nepons Dottir, who will introduce the term via the observation she did during the curriculum or during the campus week, plus her perspective. Then we will continue with two statements, uh, five minutes long, one from Bronislav Czaszynski and Chip Lord, and afterwards the floor is yours. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, Are you, am I speaking into this and you're hearing me okay? Um, uh, I am, I'm actually going to do a bit more like a, a synthesis of this. Uh, as in the session that I attended, uh, the word uh, design, as it was initially put to us, wasn't so prevalent in the session itself, but it's there underlying in the body of it all. So I just ask you, those who were in sessions in which this was more discussed to, in, the, in the conversation after, to bring up anything that I haven't uh, brought up here. But anyway, in, in contemporary English, the word uh, to design means to do or plan something with a specific purpose in mind, which is exactly what we have uh, delivered. Piecemeal, drip fed, and fragments bit by bit and effectively, blindly, in accordance with our short determinist and capitalist impulses. As we have stumbled towards the Anthropocene, and particularly rapidly through the industrial and post-industrial ages of the last 250 years. Are you hearing me okay? Yeah. Um, in this context, to declare that humanity forms nature seems by any estimation to be a demonstration of human hubris. The human capitalist project, by all its constitutive initiatives, has functioned precisely in evolutionary terms as a blind watchmaker. The object Earth, with all its overlayings of man-made infrastructures, social and political ecosystems, has materialized as a design confirming human detachment, superiority and self-appointed excellence. For many, though, there is something utterly uncomfortable and inappropriate about the word Anthropocene in that it bundles all humans into equal culpability. Donna Haraway, in a recent lecture, talks about the problematics of the term. She proposes that we consider, amongst other, capital or Cthulhu as alternative suggestions, the reason being that she considers capitalism to be profoundly active in the equation and that the Catholic epoch is approached through the impossibility of existing as an individual. Instead, we are defined by being inextricably bound up with other organisms. At the core of our thinking is speciesism. She says, it matters to destabilize worlds of thinking with other worlds of thinking. Mark and I, who I collaborate with in our collaborative art practice, have a specific and perennial interest in examining human behavior through, through the lens of specific human and non-human animal relations. We have recently completed a two-year artistic research project currently exhibited at the ASU Museum of Art in Phoenix. The project was commissioned and hosted by the Global Institute of Sustainability at ASU and prompted an art and science collaboration that would highlight and discuss issues of sustainability. A decision was made to focus on species conservation issues and the Grand Canyon National Park, an area designated both as wilderness and national park. In Early on in our research, we were drawn to two conservation programs designed to prevent the extinction of two selected species in the area. One of these was the California condor, a native bird and a cultural icon of the American wilderness. It was known to have bred in the Grand Canyon, but after near extinction has been the subject of an intense and continuing capture and release conservation program. The biggest threat to the bird's survival was thought to have been poisoning by the condor's consumption of lead when feeding at discarded gut piles left by hunters. 
To cut the long story short, the decision was made in the early 80s to capture all the 27 wild condors alive and put them in captivity. From then on, program of conservation involving selection processes and captive breeding was put in place in which humans have become caretakers of the entire species. For five years, <coughs> sorry, for five years, condors were extinct in the wild. However, during his tenure in confinement, the species thrived, and by 1992, the captive population had nearly doubled from 27 to a total of 52 birds. In the years that followed, recovery team scientists would continue to produce chicks using a battery of approaches, including intensive veterinary care, breeding techniques like multiple clutching, and DNA fingerprinting, which allowed biologists to genetically map the entire species and establish a suitable mating pairs. The next and more foreboding phase of the project, the reintroduction and re-establishment in the wild, required broad cooperation among numerous interest groups, generous funding, scientific research, and the establishment of a safe habitat for condors in the wild. This reintroduction is now considered a successful project, although it continues to be monitored and significantly maintained by man. Each condor in the wild now is tagged has a GPS attached to it, all its movements can be tracked and recorded, and each body of those that die is collected. Necropsies are conducted, and each retrieved corpse to deter determine, to determine cause of death, which are then recorded, and the bodies are preserved in refrigerated storage at the University of Arizona in Tucson. The capture and release program is high maintenance. Not only does the monitoring and retrieval of live birds keep teams of biologists busy throughout the year, but the recurrent poisoning of birds indirectly by humans goes on relatively unabated. This requires recaptured birds to undergo blood transfusion and long periods of rehabilitation in captivity. Scientists there in the field make it quite clear to us that if lead substitutes were used in the hunting of deer and other game, the counterpopulation by and large would be self-sustaining. The counter cycle you see here is only one component of an exhibition which focuses on the complexity of conservation strategies in this environment and on how one of the most consistent problematizing factor is the inconsistency of human behavior. The we, we so customarily deploy in our discussion on respect of matters environmental is misrepresented implicitly as a singular discrete phenomenon because we are irreconcilably divided in our desires and behavior. Other components in the installation, for instance, clearly place the human species as an equal constituent within a very specific and complex ecology of others, or otherwise attempt to bring human temporal myopia into focus and speculate on the effects of the short-sightedness of young species with a short life attention span and the hubris to believe the technological problems will have technological fixes. Whatever our abilities as species, it is clear that whilst we appear to mobilize design in our every action because of our inability to see and think and behave ecologically, to design ourselves out of an Anthropocene which seems to spell our own doom and the doom of many others, thousands of others, from this position a highly unlikely prospect. One of the key dynamics of the project and the exhibition for us was the management and attempted re reconcilement of two otherwise apparent oppositional components of biologists' work in the field, those of data and effect, of excitement, of sadness. Oh, no, <laughs> there is no place we are accustomed to accept in science for the recording of effect, of excitement, of sadness, anger, joy, imperative, desire in response to what is observed. And yet, what, it, what is it that drives and sustains field scientists to maintain their practice, their enthusiasm and drive for discovery and delivery on the respective programs? In this pursuit, so much of what they observe has no scientific destination or proper place consigned as it is their, their mere anecdotal. In this context, therefore, it can be argued that much of their unique experience in being disallowed is lost. 
Um, it is here that I like to return to Donna Haraway on her words. It matters to destabilize worlds of thinking with other worlds of thinking. The important word here are other worlds of thinking and destabilize. Design is such an integral part of our being. We use design not only in our own everyday lives, but also in our individual and collective approaches to progress and technology and in navigating in our physical and psychological worlds. The question is, how can our processes in designing and managing our worlds be constructively destabilized? How can the linear processes of planning in accordance with the perceived status quo be disrupted? The cultural theorist Boris Groys tells us the goal of design is to aesthetically improve the status quo, to make it more attractive, seductive and appealing to the user. Art also accepts the status quo, but it accepts it as a corpse after transformation into a mere representation. I'm almost there. <laughs> when working on a project in the early 2000s entitled Nano Flat Out and Bluesome, we conducted an artist taxi survey of taxidermic polar bears in the UK. In assembling a number of those specimens into a gallery setting, we stripped them of their museum diorama and informational signage. Hitherto, in their respective collections, they had each been used as a representation for an entire species. In our installation, we created a situation in which the audience was obliged to observe them as individual being. Later, this individuation was further reinforced in our photographic archive from the project with placing the provenances or histories of its bear integrally with its image. The disruption or destabilization active in this work was not only the dislocation of the historic status of trophy or colonial acquisition and perhaps of the temporal cultural use as icon of a declining environment. This latter can be seen as an indicator of a human approach to environmental fragility, its framing, its design, but even more poignantly, Poignantly was that we discovered that it was in the conspicuously bad or imperfectly stuffed polar bears, it was possible to find a glimpse, glimpse of life having been lived. And that the vulnerability triggered by this destabilization of our making allowed us the ability simultaneously to reflect and foretell. And here in it enables a simultaneous conflation and unraveling of the epistemologies of many of the concepts connected here to the Anthropocene, such as measurement, scale, time, and so on. If the process was to be shown diagrammatically, a cyclical or circular model would emerge, enable us to reconfigure our perceptions of this condition, which acts, I would argue, aligns and corresponds with the creative processes of art, offering us, in turn, the chance to enter the cyclic differently, with heightened sensibilities and more responsive capacities to act. The imperative here is to seize the opportunity to recalibrate, and to do this, we first need dis to disrupt a continuum of perception, belief, and consequent behaviour. Thank you very much, Brundis. Um, I have to apologize. I did my job very sloppy because for sure I should have introduced okay. Brundis <laughs> before and I just do this now, but I guess a lot of it already was in the presentation. So Brundis Sneppenstottir is an artist and she's teaching at the Icelandic Academy of the Arts in Reykjavik. As an artist, she focuses on installation-based works with a strong research grounding. Her socially engaged projects explore contemporary relationships between human and non-human animals in the context of history, culture, and environment. The next statement uh, will be done by Bronislav Szaczynski. Bronislav Szaczynski is head of the Department of Sociology at Lancaster University in the UK. His research tries to place contemporary changes in the relationship between humans, environment, and technology with the longer view of human history and culture, drawing on social theory, qualitative soci soci sociological research, and the environmental hum humanities. <clears throat> Current topics of interest include climate geoengineering and the social philosophy, philosophy <coughs> implications of the Anthropocene. 
So I'm going to... I, I, I took it, my invitation uh, to speak on this panel um, to address that, that opening sentence from the, the statement for the des design uh, seminar, which is, you know, what happens when the Earth itself becomes uh, an object of design within the Anthropocene. So I'm going to draw on work I've been doing uh, with various people thinking about geoengineering and uh, terraforming and trying to... Uh, just. There's lots that could be said about how one might think about designing a world and uh, what that what does what that does to the world, but also that what that does to the word design to do so. And these are just going to be some fragments, really. Oh, yeah, I'm going to time myself. Um, yeah, uh, so the uh, literary theorist Ursula Heiser wrote a very nice paper on uh, Martian ecologies. Uh, analyzing uh, various works of science fiction uh, about the terraforming of Mars. Um, so particularly the trilogies of Kim Stanley Robinson and Ben Bover that was published around about the 1980s and so on. Um, so there she's used, used this notion of a synthetic ecology to describe these sort of human hybrid ecologies that are partly natural and partly technological uh, that are created in non Earth environments, so that they can survive in Martian conditions. Uh, but also, she points about how in these these trilogies uh, of science fiction uh, by Robinson and Bova, Earth itself also becomes a domain towards the end of the trilogies for the establishment of synthetic ecology. So she's suggesting, in a way, that this is the future. This is the Anthropocene, a synthetic ecology. Now, obviously, synthetic is an interesting word because it sort of means artificial, but it also means the combination of opposites in some way. And I think there's an interesting play there that I might have time to bring out. So in the uh, session before now, in this room, uh, Herbert Lohner, um, mentioned this sort of idea that you know in the in the Anthropocene the world becomes an intended world so what does that actually mean you know so and what is the best word to capture the creation of synthetic ecologies in the Anthropocene is it engineered is it manufactured is it fabricated or maybe to use some more Latourian uh, language uh, uh, is it assembled are we talking about the assembling of a of a synthetic ecology or the composition the sort of placing together of different elements or is design a good word and in fact uh, in 2008 uh, Bruno Latour gave a a talk to the Design History Society where he seized on this word design and thought that uh, it was actually a rather good word to use uh, in this kind of current context. He described it as signifying a postmodernist, post Promethean theory of action and he identified five different characteristics which design has in his, his, uh, his eyes uh, which suit it for that kind of post Promethean kind of action. So he talked about its modesty, um, its attention to details, uh, its focus on the meaning of things rather than just the em empirical efficacy of things. It's also working with what already exists rather than creating out of nothing. And also it's sort of implicit notion of good and bad design, so an implicit kind of ethos or ethic. Uh, and so he suggested that it maybe wasn't a coincidence, I think, that the rise of design uh, happens at the same time when we're thinking about ecological crisis. Um, so he suggested that perhaps if we do if we do um, construct climates, they will be more designed climates in this sort of have to be in this sort of modest kind of way. Uh, so it's interesting thinking about the word design and its origins in the Italian disegno, and it sort of recalls. Uh, the rivalry or paragone between the two different aesthetic approaches in the Renaissance, uh, the Italian Renaissance in the visual arts, the, the Florentine school of disegno, of design or drawing, and the Venetian school of colore, which focuses much more on colour. So the Florentine um, Disegno focused much more on the skill of the artist, the artist's inventive mind, their control uh, of the pencil and so on, their technical skill. Uh, whereas the Venetian style was more about observation, typically oil paintings like Titian, and also focused much more on the impressions of colour, of diffused light, of the reflected light from the Venetian waters, and you know, generally more impressionistic. And it's interesting to think, to reread some of this uh, um, uh, geoengineering terraforming science fiction through the lens of that 
paragoni, that's th those two ways of thinking. And there's a lovely uh, section at the end, uh, towards the end of the final book of uh, Robinson's trilogy, Blue Mars, so he's gone through Red Mars, Green Mars, where it becomes um, filled with living things, and then Blue Mars when the, um, when the oceans return to the northern plains. Uh, and in this scene, uh, the two now aging members of the first hundred to settle on Mars, who are now watching Mars being terraformed around them, and they've got into the habit of sitting in this pavement cafe uh, uh, with a colour chart looking up at the sky um, and uh, as the sky changes colour through the year, through the months and through the Martian years, uh, trying to name these new colours that they can see that have never been seen because the sky at the moment in Mars is quite pink and it's sort of turning these strange kind of strange colours and eventually then one into evening they're sitting on the bench in the hour before sunset and Maya looked up and clutched Sachs by the arm. Oh my God, look, she said. Sax swallowed. Ah, he said, and stared. Everything was blue, sky blue, Terran sky blue, drenching everything for most of an hour, flooding their retinas and the nerve pathways in their brains, long starved, no doubt, for precisely that colour, the home that they had left forever. So in, in a sense, what they see in the sky at that moment, after months and years of very careful observation with colour charts, uh, is a kind of a moment of colore, you know, not designing a planet, but colouring it new. And I'll just finish off by sort of suggesting that I think um, and, uh, people were saying something similar in the agency session before us, that uh, in, the, in the Anthropocene it's not just the, that the, as it were, the agency of the natural world is becoming infected by the human, which is the, the dominant narrative, it's also that the agency of the human is more and more becoming imbricated with the non-human, and in a sense, you know, our... our um, uh, achievement of the status of becoming a geological force uh, is only possible because of all the other forces of nature, of fire, of chemistry, of the minerals, of the fossil fuels that we are somehow borrowing and channeling, but thereby becoming uh, uh, other than human ourselves. So I think there's a very complicated sort of set of swapping of agencies there. I better stop. Thanks a lot, Bron. The next statement will be done by Chip Lord. Chip Lord, he's Professor Emeritus for Film and Digital Media at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He was trained as an architect and is founding member, member of the legendary Ant Farm, which worked on the radical fringe of architecture, producing inflatable structures, performative events, and nomadic design. Thank you. This is a uh, visual talk, so uh, perhaps you want to position yourselves to be able to see the screen. And uh, I have a little coordination to do, so we need to bring up the. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the, uh, the title, I've already added a subtitle. The subtitle is Perspective to Witness from 1968, California. But I want to begin in the present with uh, a, a, a quote I pulled from the uh, first page of the Anthropocene Project report, The Sense of Amazement. And, as, as I walked from the hotel past this tree, I, I was amazed. Um, its branches reaching to the sky to give every leaf exposure to the sun, the only source of energy. And the leaves falling and blanketing the ground, composting seemingly before us as we walked past them, preparing the ground for the spring. Even now, they nurture and support another species that has popped up unexpectedly. And you can see this at the second light if you go out the main entrance uh, of the building. And all of this because the Earth's axial tilt 
that angle off of the perpendicular creates an ever-changing exposure to the sun. So as each, uh, each rotation over 365 days, there's a very slightly different optimized exposure to the rays of the sun. And this is, a, I think, a miraculous design. There may be somebody in the room that can explain more about how that happened. Number two, flashback. From the third hearing, the whole Earth, California, and the disappearance of the outside. I was there. I was a witness. I attended the Halperin workshop, 1968, a transdisciplinary experiment in the creative collaborative process and in the context of the counterculture. This was my first uh, postgraduate training after graduating with a Bachelor of Architecture degree, training or curriculum. And the whole Earth Catalog was my second graduate training or curriculum in the space of two months. So I founded Ant Farm, an underground or alternative or countercultural architectural practice in San Francisco. And we immediately renounced our architectural training by creating an architecture that was soft, lightweight, easily transportable, impermanent, ephemeral, and illusionary, supported by the wind, and performative. This is the clean air pod on the first Earth Day in Berkeley, 1970, where we announced, air emergency, air emergency, everybody inside the clean air pod, which was a fiction, of course. The, the inflatable was and was not architecture. It was between. Inflatable space could be transported to the desert for the production of the whole Earth Catalog supplement as a natural hot spring in the Panamint Valley. And then on the alluvial plain of the Texas Panhandle where Route 66 once ran, we planted an evolutionary diagram, the rise and fall of the tailfin, the Cadillac tailfin in 10 models. The slogan in the 1950s for Cadillac was standard of the world, standard of the world. And this echoes across a wheat field 200 meters from the interstate highway access road. It's whispered and repeated by visitors to this public artwork on private land 10 years later. And it's still there now, still in fashion, the first stanza, perhaps, of a long goodbye to the automobile. With Media Burn, we became performance artists, public artists, social practice artists, freedom of speech artists, acting up, using television to criticize television in 1975. That same year, an engagement with climate science. We designed a monument to the end of the aerosol spray can, a time capsule to remember this anthropogenic, easy on, savage, wizard, air freshener era. Sadly, it is realized but never shown publicly and then destroyed by fire, as is Ant Farm, August 8th, 1978. Number three, flashback two. There was just something going on here. The best music came from here. The Grateful Dead, Jefferson Airplane, Joan Baez, Janis Joplin, and so did the Integrated Circuit and things like the Whole Earth Catalog. So said Steve Jobs. And also, I think, paraphrasing Steve Jobs, he said, Design the package that the product comes in. Design the details. Design what the user can't see as well as what they can see. Design the experience. Get it right. Change the world. Designed in California, 
by Apple. And finally, one of the products, and to bring us back to this week of the Anthropocene curriculum, um, this is a small object of design um, created in the Imaging the Anthropocene seminar. It's a video spot. And the presentation was designed in Keynote so that the weird pixelated transitions are artifacts of the PowerPoint version, which cannot apparently dissolve. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Chip. I would like Bron back to the stage. So the floor is yours. Please pose your questions, questions to the speakers, or bring in your individual perspectives on that. Yes, please. Hi there. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, my question is for Bron. Um, at the beginning of this two-year project, Jill Bennett gave a keynote here on sort of art anthropocene. I'm not sure if Ron was there or if he's heard it, but she talked extensively about geoengineering and terraforming in relation to art design anthropocene. So given this is kind of closing the same project, I'm just wondering if Bron has any commentary. I guess it depends really if you saw Jill Bennett's keynote, the opening of this. Okay, yeah. Doesn't matter. You know, I think we could talk about this idea of amazement, for, for example, which I don't believe ever came up during the week, but the idea of a vision did come up um, in the Anthropogenic Landscape Seminar. And I guess I would ask the question, should we leave to commercial Hollywood cinema the, um, the vision to create a post-apocalyptic uh, uh, earth to create those images? Or is it the role of the artist or is it a, a collective role that we should share? What do you think? <laughs> Rhetorical well, uh, question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is, it's right. It would be nice to hear from the, it would be good to hear from the audience because, you know, I mean, I was sort of trying to argue in my talk that the artistic processes are of certain importance in this. So it would be nice to hear if anyone else shares that or has other ideas. No. I think this uh, sensation of amazement is quite an important one and I liked it a lot that you brought it up. Um, I'm not sure where this might bring us, but uh, in a sort, uh, the sensation of amazement uh, is also an experience uh, of scientific experiments. So it's, it's a very originating sensation, uh, and out of amazement, you create, you create your models, you create your experiments. Um, and I'm just wondering <laughs> if this is now uh, somehow to reconcile artistic, artistic practice uh, with scientific experiments? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, oddly, even though we're next to each other here, it was very difficult for me to hear that question. Um, could, could you just simply reframe it? Uh, sorry. Yes, yeah. it's... it's, it's <coughs> Uh, acoustically hard here. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I just was wondering uh, regarding amazement because the sensation of amazement is also um, a very originate uh, sensation for um, uh, for somehow uh, doing uh, scientific experiments. So it's a first stimulus, and out of this, you experiment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And uh, as you brought it up uh, in, in your 
uh, introduction to your presentation, um, it was uh, more meant in an, in an artistic and an human environmental uh, sensation. And I was just wondering, is this, uh, is this somehow to reconcile or finding bridges within okay. scientific experiments uh, and artistic approaches? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, <clears throat> I think uh, I would credit the, the movement, the countercultural movement, as uh, providing a, uh, a peer-supported platform for experimentation. But of course, that, uh, the counterculture was built on uh, previous movements, the civil rights movement, the anti, in the US, anti-Vietnam uh, War movement, uh, the uh, Bergerine uh, environmental movement of the late 60s. Of course, there's a much longer history there. So that at the moment of 1968, um, many of these things converged. And I, I think there was, uh, the, the impulse to both reject uh, our parents' generation, everything they made and stood for, you know, was very strong. And uh, so things had to be uh, reinvented. And the Whole Earth Catalog, for example, is um, really a reinvention of a form of education and uh, one that is all about do it yourself and access to tools. And um, I think for many people of that period, it became uh, you know, a resource equal to uh, Wikipedia and Google combined in a sense today. You know. So you could fashion your own education today probably with using, uh, you know, just going online and constructing it. Um, I, I think the one other thing it, it makes me think of though is that the Probably uh, in the uh, Anthropocene, we need these kinds of educational alternative experiments, uh, events that take place outside traditional academic institutions uh, so that they have a freedom to engage in, um, in an educational process like the one we've experienced in the past week. I think it's very important to think about other, uh, other kinds of similar experiments. In fact, uh, I assume that uh, the idea that there are seeds being planted here that will sprout in the next months and years is, uh, is crucial to uh, addressing the Anthropocene. Oh, there's lots of questions. I was just going to say, I'll, I'll just say something quickly about the amazement thing because, and science and art, because um, I think it's a really sort of complicated history, I think, of uh, thinking how these things get, Intertwined. I mean, there's, a, there's this word in uh, ancient Greek, which is thaumazain, which is um, this sort of sense of shocked awe, a certain kind of mode of knowledge. And of course, in the classical world, uh, the sort of greatest, the highest form of truth was seen to be that of contemplation, you know, quite separate from artisanal craft and making and so on. Um, and then in the scientific revolution, to compress a very complicated story into a very simple gesture, you know, there's a sort of coming together of artisanal Anal knowledge of how to make things, uh, and on the other hand, this idea of this sort of wonderful vision of the whole of nature, of, 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 of the way nature is put together. And the experiment, you know, in the Boyle's air pump or uh, in um, Galileo's inclined planes or whatever, is the sort of point at which that sort of maker's knowledge, which is sort of every day and isn't about wonder it's about um it's it isn't about standing back and looking in awe it's about getting your hands dirty and uh and and learning by, by making things that they somehow come together uh in this strange uh, topology of the experiment and out of that um out of this sort of harnessing of artisanal <laughs> makers knowledge um becomes this new new way of understanding of, of producing uh what are seen as universal objective truths about you know Newton's laws and etc and so forth and it's really interesting I mean this is a um, anecdote I mean yesterday I spent the day uh, with Sasha Engelman and Joel Thompson and Thomas Saracino and a hundred architecture students in Braunschweig uh, where where they were making solar balloons so these are balloons made out of plastic uh, which had to be launched at dawn did any get off the ground they did, excellent. I, I came back last night, but uh, we can show you some pictures if you want. Uh, but what was so fascinating for me was watching all these 
people making things and actually how do you make something which tomorrow will when it's hit by the sun, rise in the air. So this really complex combination of science, there was you know, a, a, a infrared imaging uh, equipment and uh, uh, buoyancy calculators and how, uh, calculators, uh, online calculators for the volume of a toroid and all this kind of thing. And it was all about preparing these objects to rise into the air. Um, so, and there was just, it was just the materiality of that was so interesting. So it wasn't about being, standing back and thinking, wow, this is a beautiful, amazing picture of the Earth from space, but actually plastic, tape, um, <laughs> lots of hands and a lot of willpower to try to, to make these things work. And I think that's, that's a real positive vision, I think, of uh, where art and science comes together, not just necessarily in the beautiful images, but in making things that can become animate. Okay. So it's just, just, it's a, it's a small comment. Actually, I'm a big fan of uh, Ant Farm, and uh, I'm happy to see it uh, here again. There was 10 years ago, there was a wonderful exhibition at, in, at the Berkeley Art Museum, and I think it's really uh, interesting. So, uh, and my main point, actually, it's a message of uh, hope again, uh, is that what I saw during the week is that the Ant Farm spirit is still very much here, uh, even though we live in a digital media world. We're still, I mean, there's this, this spirit that is still here, and so I'll just conclude with this. Uh, it's a, you were talking about uh, it's the seeds for the future. Uh, I would call it, this week, the Anthropocene Farm. <laughs> Yeah, just I wanted to uh, to so Bron, you you mentioned that in the Anthropocene, the, um, uh, humans realize that they've always been more than humans themselves. That because I guess they realize their actions leak into the world, and their uh, ecosystem designers maybe as any other species is. Um, but then, how do so it's come up a few times in uh, in this week that we we've sort of uh, contrasted involuntary design versus self-aware design, and it seems like there is something problematic with this distinction, as if you know that's also something you we find in a kind of grand narratives of the. Uh, ecosystem engineers who kind of say, oh yeah, we've always been participating in uh, uh, you know, the weaving of the world, or so to say, but no, we are aware of this, so no, we are going to do this uh, in a different way. What, could you say something on that? Doesn't it seem like there's some problem there? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what the answer is. I mean, you spot a very important uh, problem there, that there's something far, far too seductive about that narrative of becoming of going from unintentional to intentional climate engineering uh, for for example I mean um, I mean awareness well if the first thing to say obviously is this the way that all our knowledge of the world and our sense of being aware and intentional is mediated by um, all the um, you know the culture and knowledge technology language you know so there is no kind of uh, unmediated sort of um, awareness that can uh, sort of that it, you know so I suppose my interest in making knowledge making visible is part of that um, kind of critical line which you suggest which is that um, we need you know, as the Hakave has been very involved in, we need to kind of make visible to the critical gaze um, the uh, the backstage of knowledge production in the Anthropocene, so that we're not we don't have a sort of naive understanding that now we know how the world works and therefore uh, we can do this intentionally. Where you know the reality is, we will be sort of seeding our intention, seeding as in giving away our intention, um, just to other kinds, other forms of mediation, which may be a bit less uh, kind of. Um, transparent because of the complexity of technological architectures and scientific languages. So, sorry, I haven't got a, an answer. I think it's a great question, but I, I, I recognize the problem. This kind of builds off that, but it's maybe a little more specific in terms of thinking about design. Um, definitely an interest in the kind of flipping from this unintentional design to intentional design. But on a more specific level, there was the mention um, about this kind of idea of an ethic of design, good or bad design, and also in thinking about the kind of attempt to bridge between science and the arts and science and the humanities. I'm wondering, especially maybe to the artists, there's often within the arts this kind of division between design and fine arts and visual arts, and I'm wondering um, 
in terms of that, the idea that there might be a design ethic, <laughs> how that translates into the arts or if you see them as fairly fluidly connected. Um. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, uh, it's difficult to, because, you know, in many ways, the, I mean, I do, I do see a, a, a distinction between design and the, and the fine arts, but I think uh, there is, of course, in this, they use the processes, which are maybe kind of similar, in which they play with, uh, um, what, what was the word you used in the beginning? Admiration, was it? No. Amazement. Amazement, yeah. So, I mean, there are these factors uh, that are at, are at play in both, in both uh, design and in, in, well, in the arts, in most of the creative uh, the, um, practices. And I think that, for, for me, what I wanted to say, if I maybe kind of sideline a little bit your, your question and, and come to what Katrin was uh, referring to initially, is that I think, and having been in collaboration with, with scientists as an artist, that one often thinks about that, that we need to find a way that these things come together much earlier on in the processes because the knowledge that is being recorded through the sciences is done in a very different way than within the arts, you know. So I, I don't have a problem talking about knowledge being produced within the arts, but I guess we can also debate, <laughs> debate that. But for me, there is, that is not a problem to, uh, there. So if I think that maybe like uh, the arts, the, it will run with imagination. It will, it will amazement, it will become part of the process. Whereas for the scientists, yes, it might drive, drive their uh, research on and it's kind of part of that kind of some sort of sustainability within the practice. But ultimately the knowledge is recorded in very different form, which cuts out these things. So the question for, for, for us uh, is, is can we find a model in which these two disciplines come together much more earlier on in the process in which there is some kind of entanglement? <laughs> uh, you know, so the arts are not just coming in to illustrate or to kind of be a communicative tool for the science disciplines. I mean, this is something I'm really interested in and wanted to put out to here, um, yeah. Um, I would like to, to connect to this question and this point, um, uh, point because I want to ask you, um, we saw yesterday and today in your examples like, uh, that art is really making a point. It's, um, it's very sensitive and so, at some moment and it's illustrating a statement and then you um, make an installation or, or, or an exhibition or something. Um, and then what happened after that? And if you can say that that was part of a bigger discourse, um, if you have an example from your own experience where you have the feeling you have made a point with an installation of art or with a piece of art, and then it it um, was included in a bigger discourse or it develops in a in a, in a yeah in something um, beyond museum or beyond the yeah, yeah. the piece. Uh, can I answer? Yeah. <laughs> and I just I mean, answer in relation to uh, our own practice because of uh, what we are trying to sort of achieve or we could say what we'd like to see is that we've always made a big point to um, incorporate into uh, our exhibitions and or into that kind of period when the work goes on show that um, we have dis different discussions on different levels. So for example, in the exhibition that I referred to, there was a, a, a sort of one day conference organized in which there was a mix of art and sciences and all kind of different disciplines discussing issues inherent within the exhibition like uh, uh, conservation biology. And so, and then also, we always work with the institutions on their outreach or educational program. So, although we are artists and we make this and we work in the process, because we are trying to also put art in there as a as a, a, a viable voice in our kind of societal kind of discourse, we have made it our issue to, to work with the museum in, in establishing programs that in various ways reaches out to different people within their um, public. Yeah. Does that answer it? Or? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I, I'd, quite, I'd be interested if people were, did want to talk about the distinction between art and design and whether, whether that's a useful distinction when going back mm -hmm. to the question about mm -hmm. the ethic of design. Because <clears throat> one reason why I think Bruno Latour was attracted to the to the notion of design 
I wanted to sort of play around with it for a while, is a sense that design is an earthbound knowledge, you know, that maybe of, of forms of knowledge, you know, if we think of the skills for the collective in the Latourian language, what skills do we have um, uh, for composing a common world and due, according to due process, you know, then uh, if you think of what are the, you know, the, the sort of discourses and practices which are most allied to a kind of unearthly, superlunary perfection, you know, the idea of sort of objective view from nowhere, well it's science, um, natural sciences, it's philosophy, and possibly it's art as well, you know, sort of trying to come up with this sort of, the, the, the sort of aura it has compared with um, medicine, um, design, engineering, um, child rearing, you know, more sort of earthly skills. And I, and I think uh, it's sort of interesting to see, and obviously that sort of breaking down, that sort of distinctions between art, you know, that, that model of art, the high art model, and the distinction between art and other kind of practices such as design or politics, you know, are breaking down in interesting ways. But I think some of those residues are still there. And it's interesting how, you know, like design and engineering could be perhaps the most you know, prostituted of, of uh, forms of art, but they're also got contained within themselves a sort of an idea of of um, uh, utility to the, to the to the rest of the world. You know, as opposed to this superlunary sort of purity, which might be sometimes quite useful. I don't know what other people think. Yeah, and I, I just want to add that in the uh, anthropogenic landscape seminar, we we at the near at the near end we came up against uh, a uh, internal conflict between the practitioners that were there. And uh, uh, the proposal was put forward to take the, the data that we had collected, analysis of a specific site, and take it to the next logical design stage, uh, which would be a kind of vision of how this site might be uh, even a utopian possibility. And there, and what happened was there, there was uh, actually, I felt fear from uh, many of the participants who were uh, in more analytical disciplines. That, uh, so there was a kind of perception that design uh, itself was colonial. You know, it was going to impose something onto an existing population on a specific site. And I, I thought that was curious, you know, and of course we ran out of time. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, I think it points to, in, in a way, the, the difference of language across the disciplines. Um, and, and then in the resume session uh, that presented that uh, seminar, uh, the geopolitics seminar uh, only showed works of the imagination, a satirical uh, anth anthropo uh, Anthropocene insurance company, uh, a plan that had been detailed, almost a, could, have been, could play on the onion, you know, in, in a very interesting way as a satire. So it was kind of interesting to me that, you know, imagination could not be used in looking at the anthropogenic landscape. But in the geopolitics seminar, it seemed to be all about imagination as a solution. And that was very interesting. <laughs>